Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show here and welcome to Forensics Talks. And this is our episode 45, so we're starting to get up there. Um, today is uh, the first time we're actually going to be live streaming to three separate places. So we're going to give this a go and I hope that this uh, really works out. So we're going to be doing LinkedIn, we're going to be doing Facebook, and we are also doing direct to YouTube. So um, I'm going to wish myself luck and hopefully nothing uh, crashes or goes astray here. Uh, just a couple of quick things before we get started, and that's on um, some of the courses and such that are coming up. Um, there's been a bunch of people who've already registered, but uh, on Monday and Tuesday of next week, so October 25th and 26th, I'm going to be running the Cloud Compare course. And so uh, for many of you who are working in the area using 3D technologies and things like that, uh, photogrammetry, uh, you know, working with drones or laser scanners and things like that, if you're interested, then um, this is uh, might be a course for you. OK, also, uh, the other one, uh, well, let me get back up here. Let me uh, get you the link here in case you want to uh, uh, register for that. You need a place to go to. So all you got to do is just go to my uh, wrong one. Ha ha ha. Uh, this is where you got to go. Just got to go to AI23D.com. And if you go there, go to the training page and then you'll be fine. Uh, it'll show where the course is and that sort of thing. Now, the other thing that I'd like to uh, keep you aware of, and I've announced this last week, is the uh, Forensic Photography Symposium. So that's coming up on January 17th to 20, 2022. So that is a symposium that's dedicated to forensic photography. So whether you're working in crash scene analysis or whether you're doing crime scenes, uh, this is really uh, going to bring people together from all over the world. It is a virtual event, but it will be four days. Um, running from like 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. each day. There are some morning sessions that are gonna be a little bit more focused, but it's really about solving problems in forensic photography. So uh, things like working in infrared, uh, HDR, uh, focus stacking and stuff like that. So if you are interested in that, then um, you can go ahead and just go to the website. It's ai23d.com slash FPS. Okay, that's Forensic Photography Symposium. Also, abstracts are, are, are open as well. So if you're interested in presenting, uh, there is a page uh, down here. It's just slash FPS.abstracts. And uh, just put in all your information. It's going to force you to upload a headshot. And then you should be good to go. All righty. Let's uh, move on here and let's get into it right away. So um, my guest for today is, let me just bring this up here, sorry, is Professor Daniel Simons and he's in the Department of Psychology at the University of Illinois. He received a BA in Psychology and Cognitive Science from Carleton College and a PhD in Experimental Psychology from Cornell University. He spent five years on the faculty in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University first as an assistant professor and then as the John Loeb associate professor. Eventually, he moved to the University of Illinois in 2002. In 2003, Dan received a Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contribution to Psychology from the American Psychological Association. And then the, the next year in 2004, Dan and a colleague of his jointly received the Ig Nobel Prize in Psychology for what is perhaps his most famous research showing that it's possible to hide a gorilla in plain sight. And we're definitely going to uh, mention that and talk about it during the talk. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting Dan in the Netherlands, and I think it's over a decade now or roughly a decade uh, at a conference that we both spoke at. And it was very clear to me at the time that his research had a lot of significance in forensic investigations, whether it was for eyewitness perspectives or even people who are directly involved in traumatic events and that sort of thing. So um, I'm going to bring him in here. So, hey, Dan, how you doing? Hi. Good. How are you? Uh, doing well, doing well. It's been a long time since we've been in person face to face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about a decade, right? Yeah, I think so. Time flies. Um, so the first thing I usually um, say when with people that are uh, guests here is I like to go back before they were, you know, professionals or whatever, and you know maybe starting from you know before maybe even you were, a, 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 you know, a, a student in university. But were you always interested in psychology? Were you more scientific? Like what was your thing back then? Um, I, I was always interested in science, but I went to college as a classic liberal arts student. I had no idea what I wanted to do. <laughs> uh, I went in thinking, hey, maybe I do physics, maybe I do English. I, I had no idea. Um, and it, it was only after taking a couple of psychology classes that I started to get more interested in the kind of thinking that that's involved in psychology research. I but, see. 
Ideally, you know, actually the area that I, that I ended up in is cognitive psychology, study of thinking, attention, perception, reasoning. And that was one of my least favorite classes um, in terms of the content when I took, uh, when I took psychology as an undergraduate, but really? the style of thinking was what I really liked, not uh, within cognitive psychology, not, not so much the content, but the, the sort of way of approaching problems. So that, that's really what got me interested. In and so once you were, uh, once you, you know, doing your PhD and those types of things, mm -hmm. when, when did, uh, when did you sort of get the first sort of like realization, like, Hey, I'm onto something here. There's something going on here with perception yeah. and all that stuff. I actually started out doing cognitive development. So I, I started out working with preschool age kids and trying to understand how they could infer what was inside different kinds of objects, even though they'd never really seen inside objects. And I, I was kind of interested in categories and how people perceived categories of objects and the differences between them and what they expected for them. And just started doing a study of change detection to look at categories, right? So we were interested in Hey, do people think about animals and objects differently? Right? And do they keep track of some properties like the shape of objects more than they do for animals that can you know, change their shape as they move? Um, so we just set up a really simple kind of animation in which an object went behind a screen and came out slightly changed to see, hey, do people think about these categories differently? Will they keep track of them? And nobody noticed any of the changes. So that kind of got us started. Um, and in grad school, I worked with uh, Daniel Levin, um, who is a filmmaker and a psychologist. Um, and we started doing change detection films and looking at errors in movies and how people don't notice those. So that, that's kind of where it started off. Right, right. Okay. Um, so there's, there's, I mean, I, I've read your book. I've, mm -hmm. I've gone through, I've looked at the papers and stuff like that. And there's a lot to talk about. But I'd like to somehow through the talk... Um, look at this from a few different perspectives, one from the perspective of the eyewitness, mm -hmm. one from the perspective of maybe like, for example, a police officer who's in sort of a very difficult or, or sort of intense situation. And then from the perspective of investigators or jurors or people who are going to be judging other people based on what they recall from their memory or perhaps what they saw. Yeah, sure. So I think the, the first thing that I wanted to ask that I would like to ask is mm -hmm. about how people perceive, like, how is it, what is it about, or, or what, what is the mechanism of human vision and human perception and how does it work that mm -hmm. helps us and hurts us? Yes, it's a great question. That's got a couple thousand years worth of, <laughs> worth of research. Um, but I, I think uh, one way to think about perception and attention and memory and how it helps and hurts is to think about what we think about perception and attention and how we think about it working. So we're not really aware of the process of sensory perception, right? We're not really aware of our retinas. We're aware of the information that's out there in the world, but we have strong intuitions about how perception works that often are really wrong. Um, and that can have consequences. So I think the way, the broad way to, that I think about this is that for the most part, perception and attention and memory work great for us. They accomplish what we need to do. We wouldn't have survived as a species if they didn't. Um, they give us the information we need. They let us focus and ignore distractions. Um, they let us kind of look for the things we expect to see and pick those up quickly. Um, maybe not the things that we don't expect to see. And that ability to focus, to zero in on the things that we care about and to try and encode them more richly. That's what perception does really, really well. Okay. What and we often fail to do is think about the consequences of those abilities. So it's great that we're able to focus and ignore distractions, but that means sometimes the things that we are ignoring, we don't know about, and that might be important to us. So, right. yeah. What What is it that, uh, like you, you actually did a study, and I'll, I'll even bring it up here in a second, but what do people believe about perception and memory? So for example, like sort of there's the actual functioning and the, what how people actually perform. And then what about how people think they can perceive and recall? Yeah, so that, that's, that's one of the things that I've been most interested in. It was actually the central theme in our book, um, which was the cases in which our intuitions about how our own minds work are mismatched with the reality of how they work, right? And, we hold really strong intuitions because our experiences, our daily experiences are incomplete. We don't realize what we're missing, so we don't really take it into account. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the strongest result that we have, and I think the thing that's really underlies most of the interesting things that, the, the things that I find interesting to study are cases in which we think we're going to see something and we don't. And 
people have really strong intuitions that if something important happens right in front of us, if something is uh, really relevant to us and we would want to know it, notice that it's there, we assume that we'll notice it. When in reality, a lot of the time we don't, especially if it's an unexpected thing. Um, the same is true for memory. We tend to think that when we recall something really vividly, that that inherently means that it's accurate. Right. It doesn't. And our memories are often distorted, but we often don't go back and check to make sure that they were accurate. So that applies to a lot of how we reason. We tend to tend to be overconfident in what we remember and know um, because we rarely have to check that we're right. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, can you talk about this particular study? Yeah. Um, this was done, uh, was this 2000 and 2010 and 2011, we had two, two different studies around that time. Okay, and and this was a, this was like a survey where you're, you're going mm -hmm. to people and you're saying, hey, you know, hey, how well, you know, how, how good is your memory? And, and you ask them a number of questions. What was the, what was the big takeaway from, it, from this particular paper? It was actually a nationally representative survey. So it was a couple of surveys with uh, 1,000 to 1,500 people kind of normed to census numbers for 2010. Um, and what we did was ask people whether or not they agreed, whether they agreed or disagreed with a whole series of statements about psychology, the mind, the way we think, the way we remember. Um, and these were statements that expert consensus um, says were false, right? things that just are not true based on what we know from decades and decades of research. So mm -hmm. um, as any of you who've ever worked with academics know, getting all academics to agree on anything is about as hard as herding cats. Um, but in this case, we actually had uniformity that the experts agreed. Nope, that's not a true statement. Um, it included things like the myth that we only use 10% of our brain, which is the basis of a lot of science fiction movies, just not true. Um, but it also included a number of statements about how accurate memory is or how much we'll perceive. So we asked people, if you were um, paying attention to something else, would you notice if something unexpected appeared? Or um, can you feel somebody staring at the back of your head? Which it turns out, no, you can't. There's been over 120 years now of research showing that, no, you, you can't. Right. Um, and you can't make people turn around by staring at the back of their heads. Um, but a lot of these, and we also asked about memory, right? Do you think memory works like a video camera? So you can kind of play back your memories and inspect them. Um, and people believe that, at least a subset of people believe that. Um, those sorts of strong beliefs make a lot of sense if you think about your daily experiences and what you've what you've done right so if you are paying attention to something in the environment and something unexpected happens and you notice it well then you're aware of that you're aware of the fact that you've noticed it but you're not aware of any of the ones you've missed <laughs> we tend to think we notice I, i've had people come into the lab and say yeah i always notice errors in movies i spot them every time right? and i can guarantee you they're wrong because i can sit them down in front of a tv play a one minute movie with 10 changes that are bigger than any editing mistakes that would ever happen in a Hollywood movie. And they don't see any of them. Right. So they think they'll see them because they're only aware of the ones they notice and they're completely oblivious to the ones that they didn't notice. Right. So yeah, that, that's kind of the principle. Yeah. Right. I think you've been involved in some research where you've done some of this kind of thing where you, mm -hmm. you you'll take like a video and then you'll start with like a character at a, at a mm -hmm. I think the one was the, the office desk or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the, the character walks around, but the next time you pan to the shot, it's a completely different person. Mm -hmm. And then the next time you use the shot, it's like completely different clothing and, and all kinds of stuff. And people are like, oh, yeah. yeah, it was the same person. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. We, we've actually walked up to people and asked for directions. And while they're giving directions, we have a couple of people come by with a big door replace the first person with another person. And half the time people have no idea that they're giving directions to somebody else. Right? Um, yeah. So, so much for being like, you know, super perceptive, eagle eyed and everything else. Right. Well, yeah. People are being super perceptive about what's important in the scene. They're just not keeping track of every detail. And that's, that's the key, right? They think they're being attentive to the details. They think they'd remember if they were talking to somebody else, but you don't, and unless somebody says, Hey, by the way, that's a different person. They never know. Right. And, and so let, let, let's, I, we got to get the gorilla experiment out of the way. So um, what was the, uh, at what point did you say, Hey, look, we need to, we need to define a really, you know, it, it, I think the, I think the beauty of the experiment is just, it's just a, a lovely, simple experiment. It's a lot of fun, but it, yeah. it, it, it really makes a strong point. Right. And, and I think that's it. So how did, how did you start on that particular experiment? Because uh, I think it's famous. Everybody knows the gorilla experiment. In fact, I'm just, I'm just going to post the link here to everybody. Uh, that's the, uh, real experiment that I just posted in the comments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was actually designed to build on much earlier work. So the, the original sort of variants of that were done by uh, one of the founders of the field of cognitive psychology, uh, Ulrich Neisser, 
um, in the 1970s. Uh, and he used a very similar task. Um, but what he was interested in was how people focus attention. So do people focus attention and take in everything in the spotlight of where they're focusing their attention? Or do they pay attention to individual objects, in which case you could miss something that was literally right next to where you're focusing, where you're looking, where you're paying attention, passing right through that spot and you could miss it. Um, and that was kind of a big debate in the 1970s about how attention worked. Did you select a region of space or do you select individual things or features or objects or details to pay attention to? Um, so his videos were this sort of partially overlapping, transparent, ghostly images, right? He, he did it by super, literally superimposing separate films using mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, so part of our goal was to recreate that and to do it in a way that, so we, we did exactly his studies, but with better editing technology. Um, and we also decided to shoot the whole thing with a single camera shot so that it really was fully visible. And one of the critiques we often saw of Nicer's early work was that, well, of course people miss things. It's a weird display. It's something about the display that's just kind of not typical, not normal. Mm -hmm. And because of that, people miss things. So we wanted to kind of make it as in your face as we could. So we shot it with a single camera. And rather than having, say, a woman with an umbrella walking through a scene, we had a person with a gorilla suit walk into the middle, thump their chest, walk off the other side. Yeah, right. and, yeah. and it's <laughs> it's and plainly obvious when you look at it, when you see, you see yeah, it, but when you're if, tasked if, with something else. Exactly. If you're just watching it, you'll see it. Right? But if you're trying to do the task we give you, which is, say, counting the number of times three players wearing white pass, complete a pass of a ball, then about half the time people miss it. Right? And it's yeah. a pretty robust effect. I mean, it'll, it'll work. If, if you've already seen it, you can show it to some people who haven't, and about half of them will see it, and about half won't. Yeah. And you, you call it now, is this, is this something that you, you refer, I, I want to mention your book here, because for those of you that don't know, it's called uh, the, the invisible gorilla and I'm just going to add it here so you can get this on Amazon or whatever. So I read it. It's a good read and it tells us a lot. Um, what, what does this say when we put this into a forensic perspective about the ability for eyewitnesses to remember to, or to, first of all, to perceive properly, mm -hmm. And maybe we'll get into, well, let's talk about memory as well, because memory is an important factor too. So what does this say about how reliable eyewitnesses are? I mean, this particular study, you know, and the book I should mention is not really about that one study. It's about the mechanisms of our mind and our intuitions right. about how our minds work um, much more broadly. So um, we, we talk about a lot of things related to forensics in there as well. Um, what, what studies like that one show is that we can have somebody witness a scene and depending on what they're focusing their attention on, they may be completely oblivious to other details that in hindsight are totally obvious. Right? So um, I think of most eyewitness situations as a lot like the situation of say a radiologist examining an x-ray, right? If they know that they're looking for a fracture, they might not notice that precursor of a tumor because it's not what they're looking for. And that's why radiologists get sued a lot for malpractice, because in hindsight, you can go back and say, oh, yeah, there it is. Now we know mm -hmm. a year later that you've developed a tumor and you can find the precursor of it. But there's not a reason that they would necessarily be looking for that. And that's true for most cases in which we're dealing with real world perception. There's only so much we can take in. We can't take in all of the details of our world because we focus attention. We've got limited capacity for that because we're only taking in so much and what we see to a large, and what we focus on depends on what we expect to see and what we're looking for. That means different people can look at the same scene and remember totally different details mm -hmm. because they're focusing on different details. They might all be right and and see different aspects of the scene and yeah. maybe interpret it differently. You did a uh, you did a study uh, a while back, 2014, and I'll bring it up here in a second. It's called Identifying the Culprit. Well, I think it was a part mm -hmm. uh, it, with, with a yeah. number of other people, but Assessing yeah. Eyewitness Identification. And yeah. uh, what can you tell me about uh, that particular study? So this came from, was this the National Academy? Yeah, National that wasn't actually, it, was, it wasn't actually a study. It was a comprehensive report. Um, oh, so you. the National Academy of Sciences will, will put together a panel of experts from across a range of its across the entire spectrum to address a topic. Right? So this was a panel that was designed to look at the current state of knowledge for eyewitness accuracy and eyewitness testimony. And that included, um, so I, I was a very, very small part on this. I wasn't the lead on this. I, I was an expert researcher brought in to help with particular details about eyewitness memory and lineups, for example. Um, but the broader scope included uh, 
judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, experts on memory distortion, experts on the role of stress in memory, police experts, so the, the full range of expertise. And then they also would have people contributing to the panel by coming in and speaking to the panel, giving testimony about their own research. Um, there were hundreds of papers that were connected to this report. So it's, it's considered to be a comprehensive state of the science from a legal, uh, scientific, um, and practical perspective. Okay. Um, so it, it includes entire sections on uh, judicial precedents for eyewitness testimony and changing standards for what, what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed. Um, it included large sections on what best practices are for conducting lineups. Right? Um, so the full, the full range of factors that can influence accuracy of an eyewitness. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. we know now that there are many cases, uh, wrongful conviction cases yeah. that were primarily based on eyewitness yeah. identification. Yeah. We heard a lot of testimony from the Innocence Project and other groups as well who are, you know, make it their mission to deal with exactly those sorts of cases, um, mm -hmm. false conviction based on uh, faulty eyewitnesses. I want to ask you about, uh, so for example, like in the, the grill experiment, I mean, it's fairly casual. People watch it. It's fun and everything else. It's ridiculous. You know, it's it's but, intentionally that way. Yeah. Right. But yeah. what happens when it isn't fun? What happens when you are in a stressful situation? For example, you're a police officer mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you know, you're in a confrontation or you're an eyewitness and, you know, or you're, you're a victim of something. You're getting held at gunpoint. Um, mm -hmm. How does the performance of people's perception and memory change under these stressful situations? Yeah, there, there's not enough research yet on, on how things like inattentional blindness, failures of awareness are influenced by stress. There's a bit of work on memory and memory distortion and stress. It's not really my, my area of expertise. Um, what we can say is that even when you're not under stress, even under just typical conditions, just walking down the street sorts of conditions, nothing stressful going on at all, um, you're still not taking in everything. Right? So you're not going to be uh, broadly able to say, hey, I wanna take in anything that matters here. That's just not something we're capable of doing. We always have limits. Um, anything that causes us to focus our attention more intently is going to make us less likely to notice something unexpected. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the sort of general principle that if you're really trying hard to focus on something, then you tend not to notice things that are outside of that focus whether they're just dissimilar from the things you're paying attention to or just not spatially in the same place, or even if they're right there, but they're not the kind of thing you're trying to pay attention to, you can right. miss them. Actually, this leads me to the next question, which is yeah. this study, because this is yeah. where people, this is, you know, police officers who are trained to right. see things. Uh, tell us about this particular study. Yeah. So this, this was um, one, one of the criti criticisms of the sorts of inattentional blindness work that we do is you're mostly dealing with detection of people in gorilla suits or simple shapes moving on screens, things that have no consequence, right? And one of the hypotheses that we had about this was maybe it's just irrelevant stuff and irrelevant stuff doesn't matter so much, so we don't see it. Um, and one of our questions there was, what would happen if we actually made sure that the unexpected thing was completely relevant, was really important to the task that you were trying to do? Mm -hmm. um, but unexpected still. So this was a study I, I did with uh, Mike Schlosser, who's the director of the Police Training Institute that's based in Champaign, uh, does a lot of the statewide police training. Um, he's actually a PhD in ed psych as well, um, and does a lot of research on uh, police practice stuff. Um, so what we were interested in was, um, would police officers who were trained to be attentive to details um, notice something unexpected that was clearly relevant to them. So at the Police Training Institute, they do a lot of simulations as part of their training. They'll have paid actors who are typically former police officers who have acting experience and are really good at what they do. They've done this for many years. They'll simulate hostage situations, traffic stops, uh, domestic disputes, all of the sorts of situations that can lead to danger to police officers and, yeah. to, the, and to the public. Um, so uh, in, in that study, we just had a simulated traffic stop Right. So um, we told the trainees and also experienced officers with typically about 10 years or more of experience on the street um, that this we had a police car parked behind a parked car and said, OK, this person, you've just pulled them over for running a stop sign. Go through your procedures to issue issue a citation. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they walk up to the car, the actors in the car. 
Um, and the actor we had acting in one of two different ways, either really sort of apologetic and you know compliant and and just like, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I, I know I ran the stop sign versus somewhat belligerent, still compliant. They still gave the license and insurance information, um, but kind of in your face complaining about quotas. And, and the guy we had doing the acting is a big guy. I mean, he's about six foot five and, and he, he's intense. He comes across, you know, as pretty angry. Um, so the officers or the trainees would come up and they'd, uh, you know, approach the car the way they would normally do that. Um, what they didn't know was that sitting on the dashboard of the car was a gun. So it was in plain sight. It's kind of a weird place for a gun, but just above the glove box, um, this gun is sitting there. That, yeah, you can show the image from it. That yeah, I'm we'll exactly see. There. Um, so uh, what happens, right? So you ask people, um, yeah, there, there it is. And there's, I think, there's a, yeah, you can see the close up. It's just this gun sitting on the dashboard. Yeah. Right? And it's fully in view from, the, from where the officer was standing by the driver's side window. Um, and what they're supposed to do when you see a gun is call attention to it, right? it. It doesn't matter how you call attention to it. So they can draw their gun, they can, which is maybe a little too aggressive. Um, they, the more experienced the officer, the more likely they were to say, sir, I see that you have a gun on the dashboard. Do you have a permit for it? And just make it a regular conversational issue and not something that you know they freak out about mm -hmm. um, just to try and de-escalate the situation. Um, but they have to do something. You have to call attention to the fact that there's a gun there. And um, so when they did, when they did call attention to it, we could stop the interaction because we knew that they'd seen it. Um, if they didn't, they went through the whole process of issuing a ticket, walking back to their car, filling out all the information, taking the driver's license and, and insurance. Um, and when we interviewed them afterwards, so that I, I wasn't actually present when they were doing this. I was around the corner hidden um, and they'd send them over to me and I'd talk to them a little bit about what they'd seen. Um, and uh, what we found was that um, about a third of the experienced officers didn't see the gun, uh, about a little over, about 58%, I believe, of the trainees didn't see the gun. Mm. Um, and it might not be that big of an individual difference. It might be that the trainees were just more focused on their procedures for how you do a traffic stop. Whereas the experienced officers, that's just routine. Yeah. What we did afterwards was um, we walked the entire group back. So everybody who participated in the study, because we didn't want to single anybody out to tell any of these officers who had missed it and who hadn't, because it, it's really kind of a flip of the coin, whether or not you happen to miss it. Um, there, there aren't noticers and missers, as best we can tell. But they walk up and see it, and like we're kind of shocked. right? And that's, that's the yeah. aspect that I'm most interested in. I see. That, People are convinced that, of course, I'd notice if there were a gun there because that matters to me. But in reality, a lot of the time they don't. Right? And they're shocked when you point out what they've missed because they assume, and we all do, that we'd notice something that important. Yeah. I, I was wondering, um, so obviously this is you know officer safety that they, they need to be able to sort of identify that there's a weapon or something mm -hmm. to that effect. Uh, yeah. But I'm wondering if the... Um, if the opposite has ever happened or if you've encountered where there's actually nothing there, but they think there's something there? Um, we always ask, right? So another aspect of the studies that we tend to do, we tend to ask uh, to see whether people will false alarm, right? Whether they'll say that they saw something that wasn't actually there. So in this particular study, we asked them whether they saw any drug paraphernalia in the car. Um, and nobody false alarms to that. They said, no, I didn't see anything like that, right? And there wasn't anything in the car. Um, but for exactly that reason, we want to see, will people claim to have seen something that they haven't? At least in this kind of controlled sort of situation, it's a simulated traffic stop, not a real one. Um, there's no real danger to the officers and they weren't they weren't carrying, you know, live ammunition. Um, so, you know, we, we wanted to make sure nobody accidentally shot somebody. Um, so there wasn't any immediate true danger. We don't know how well that would generalize to a real case, mm -hmm. but there's no reason to think people would notice more often under those conditions. Interesting. Was there any was there any indication that time was a factor? So, for example, you know, they walk up and they're there a little bit longer and they're kind of they're looking around and it's like, oh, oh, wait a sec. Now there's a gun. Or was it just people sat there the whole time and they were oblivious? Yeah. Generally, if they were going to notice it, they noticed it pretty quickly. Um, they just happened to. And I really think it's just a matter of happening to glance at that spot. And you know, if, if you if you're a police officer and you you've done traffic stops and you think it might be a risk situation, 
what you're often trained to do is focus on the hands, right? Because if they don't have anything in their hands and there's nothing that they're grabbing, then that's that's basically the safety risk, right? right. Um, so you focus on where they're reaching, where they're where they're putting their hands, what's near their hands. Um, and if you don't happen to kind of take a glance at the rest of the car at the right moment, you just miss it. Right? You just don't see it. Right? Yeah, and makes sense. There's at least some suggestion that if you don't see something right away, you tend not to see it over time, right? So hanging out there longer isn't necessarily going to help. Right. Let me ask you about memory. And there's a quote mm -hmm. in your book I'd like to read if, if possible here. And it says, um, it starts off with, you know, can we ever trust our memories? Mm -hmm. And it says, in many cases, memory distortions and embellishments are minor matters, but in some contexts, they may have tremendous consequences mm -hmm. precisely because of the illusion of memory. When people are subject to the illusion of memory, they impugn the intentions and motivations of those who are innocently misremembering. And so mm -hmm. right off the bat, when I read that, you know, I'm thinking about trials. I'm thinking about witnesses recounting stuff. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about the human ability to recount memories and maybe especially traumatic events or things which are really intense? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, this comes back to what we think about how our memory works and not just how our memory works, right? So um, people who study memory have known for many decades that memories aren't like a perfect recording, right? They're not like in, in the old days of videotape and the more recent days of DVD. Um, but now if you stream the same movie every time, you see it the same way. It's not changing. Right. Yeah. And we kind of think that our memories work like that, because when you recall something that was really vivid to you, something that was really important, let's say you were a witness to a crime or you're remembering the birth of a child or you remember your wedding. Right. So you remember these vivid events and it feels like you can play back details, right? at least for many people. Mm -hmm. um, what's problematic for those memories is that they can change just like any other memory. They get distorted over time. We all know we can forget our keys or where we put our keys or where we parked our car. That's that's not what we're talking about here. It's it's those things that we think of as meaningful and things we want to remember. We assume that when we recall those, we're getting it perfectly right. And the reality is we often aren't. The, the problem is that we very rarely have the experience of having those memories challenged. Right? And, and there, there's, there are groups of people who do have that and that show very clearly how our memories can get distorted. So mm -hmm. one group um, are politicians. Right? And I have kind of a stock op-ed that I could release every single election season. There's going to be some politician who remembers something that happened to them some years ago. And it's a story that they tell all the time. And it gets embellished over time. It's like the fish that they've caught gets bigger and bigger. The right. experience becomes more and more dangerous, right? It's They become more and more heroic, right? And that sort of failure, it's not, it's not limited to one political position. Everybody has this sort of experience. The difference between a politician and you or me is that they have journalists following them around and checking all their stories. <laughs> so they find the errors. Right? And people who watch movies, right? People who are responsible on movie sets for catching errors in editing. If you talk to them, what they'll say is, yeah, maybe I have a better visual memory than most, but not great. What I do know is not to rely on it because they could say, I could swear to you that the person had their jacket on their right shoulder. And then they go back and look at the actual record of what was filmed. And it wasn't right? that yeah. they get that confirmation that their memory was wrong. So they develop the right intuitions. Most of us never do. And if you remember something differently than your spouse does, or you each have a, you have a childhood friend and you remember some childhood event and they remember it happening to them and you remember it happening to you, um, you're going to be convinced that they're lying or that they have it wrong because your memory is vivid. Right. But of course, right. so is theirs. Right. I want to ask you about a term that you use uh, mm -hmm. in, in the book, whatever, but it has to, it's called flashbulb memory. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you mean by a flashbulb memory? Yeah. So this was, this was an idea that um, has been around for a long time. Um, it's uh, the idea is that when something is, uh, I can tell you how long it's been around. It's been around since cameras had flashbulbs. Oh, right? really? 1850s. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So the idea was that when you are experiencing an important event, it's as if a flashbulb goes off and kind of burns that image onto film so that you can kind of recall it with a vivid detail. And there were lots of studies of people's memories for really important societal events, right? So the assassination of John F. Kennedy or the Challenger explosion. 
Um, there have been many, many studies. Every time there's there's kind of a cottage industry in the psychology of memory research that whenever there's some sort of horrible catastrophe, people go out and study memory for it the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the finding that kind of emerged in uh, starting in the late 1970s and then more recently was that these memories everybody had assumed prior to that, that when people recall these really vivid details of what they were doing and where they were when Kennedy was assassinated, that their memories were accurate. And Dick Neisser, Ulrich Neisser, the same person who did some of the original in, inattentional blindness gorilla video sort of stuff, um, did some of the early work on this uh, following the Challenger explosion. Mm-hmm. So the day afterwards, he asked a whole bunch of students in their freshman year class to recall exactly what they were doing. Right? So a kind of an eyewitness account, almost at the right time of the event, so the next day, so presumably pretty accurate. And then he had them come back unexpectedly as seniors to recall it again and found big discrepancies in what they reported. Um, one of them had been in class, but later reported having been at home. Um, you know, people reported somebody uh, as a senior reported somebody going down the hall screaming that the challenger had exploded when they'd actually been in class and that hadn't happened. People recalled really vivid details that mm-hmm. just weren't true. Um, and that idea of a flashbulb memory, the idea that it's burned indelibly into, into the film of your, of your brain doesn't seem to be right. Yeah. Makes you sense. Can be very confident about it and very wrong. Well, I want to talk about that, that part mm-hmm. of confidence because that comes up, but also the details. And in fact, again, there's mm-hmm. another, there's another paragraph and it just, again, as soon as I read it, it was like, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is important to, for example, trials and how mm-hmm. people are judged. Mm-hmm. And it says here, um, unfortunately people regularly use vividness and emotionality as an indicator of accuracy. They use these cues to assess how confident they are in a memory. Critically, people also judge the accuracy of another person's memory based on how much confidence that person expresses in the memory. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is really interesting because, I mean, I've, I've worked cases where, you know, they'll be asking an officer, like, mm-hmm. you know, and the officer's like, I, I, I don't remember, I, 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 stuff mm-hmm. like that. And what do you mean you don't remember? And then otherwise, you know, people will be like, oh, yeah, and then when there was this happened and all they, they talk about all these details. Right. And it seems from your book, what you're saying is people will believe you if you can bring up all the little details. Yeah, we tend to be, and so there, there are kind of two aspects to that, what we call the illusion of confidence. One is that we associate confidence with accuracy in ourselves. So if you're sure you remember something, you're going to be even more sure that you're right. Um, that, that confidence tends to make us think that we've got it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and we tend to kind of judge confidence of other, accuracy of others based on how certain they seem, right? And that's a huge problem in the courts. So if you look at the evidence on eyewitness accuracy, right, and and you look at, say, the cases from the Innocence Project where people were convicted and then exonerated based on DNA testing later, um, in the majority of those sorts of cases, the initial testimony, the initial eyewitness identification was made without a lot of confidence. So the person would say, well, yeah, I think that's them. I'm not absolutely certain. But by the time they get to the courtroom, they're sure. Right. Oh, yeah. um, so courtroom testimony about confidence, confidence in your judgment is not a good indicator of accuracy. Confidence at the very first time you do an identification tends to be pretty good. Mm, really? So, but this is not something that's made it to the courts. Right? What we what we rely on in the courts is what's said in court. Right. Everything is presented as evidence by a witness in some form, an expert or an officer or an eyewitness. Right. That's how the evidence gets into the court case. Um, and really, if we're trying to think about when confidence information should be used, it should be confidence in the initial eyewitness identification, not confidence when they're sitting on the stand, because Uh that's, that's not going to be as accurate. That can get changed over time. The more times you recall something, the more likely you are to become more confident in it, even if you become less accurate in it. Well, that, and that makes total sense. I mean, in terms of, I mean, there's, there's the, the uh, effect of bias, there's all kinds of other things that can happen afterwards. So that does yeah. make a lot of sense, but I've never, yeah. I've never, I don't um, think anyone has implemented anything to that effect. It, uh, it's hard to do given our, given the way our legal system is structured. And, and of course the initial testimony can be biased as well, right? I mean, right. If, if you ask leading questions, you get, you get the wrong answers sometimes. If you, if you aren't doing a double blind lineup, you can unintentionally mislead people into picking somebody when they wouldn't otherwise, right? There there are lots of things that can cause an initial identification to go wrong, but assuming it's done right, and you can get an indication of how confident the person is in their judgment right then, 
that's likely that confidence then is pretty well associated with accuracy. It's not perfect, but it's, it's much better. But confidence days, weeks, months later, after having been asked about it many times, is not a good predictor. And that's, that's one of the really challenging things um, for our court system is that a jury is going to believe a witness who says, that's the person, I know it, I saw them. Even if yeah. when they first did their identifications, like, yeah, I think so, but I'm not positive. <laughs> yeah. So do you see any way where, you know, you get to, at trials or whatever, that we can put some kind of a better sort of weight scale on testimony or on, you know, you know, just with whether it's a, a, the suspect, the victim, the police or, or, yeah. or whatever. I mean, how can we improve upon what we have now? I would love for it to be the case that you could have documentation of the initial eyewitness identification and the initial confidence re recorded in a good way, right? Recorded objectively, entered into the court as evidence of the person's confidence and not rely on confidence at that moment that they're testifying. Right. right. Um, that's hard to do, right? Because when you've got a witness right in front of you and they're speaking with confidence, it's hard to ignore that in favor of a report from from earlier but really that's the testimony that that's the confidence testimony that should be allowed the, the yeah. memory testimony yeah i mean you want them to recall what they remember but having having the original record to show that their memory is consistent would help too yeah and, and you made a there was another um there was another interesting aspect in the book when you talked about memory which had to do with uh and i don't, I don't remember if i believe that the term but it had to do with uh so for example one example was uh where there was a photo that was edited but mm -hmm. you were able to inject a false memory into somebody's you know somebody's mind yeah yeah this is there's been a lot of work on on this sort of what's known as the misinformation effect um and that's that's where the danger comes from leading uh, you know, leading testimony or leading witnesses um, to answer questions because you can insert information into their memory if you do it in the right way. Um, mm -hmm. th this line of research, I think, really took off in the 1980s when there was a rash of accusations of childhood sexual abuse, um, which is, of course, a huge concern. Um, but there were a lot of accusations that um, on their face had no plausibility at all, right? So claims that there were satanic rituals that were killing babies in large numbers that, that just couldn't have been true. But people were convicted on the basis of recovered memories at that time. And one of the big concerns was there was that some of those memories could be planted by asking enough biased questions. Um, the, the sort of plant, the, the sort of a biasing that can happen in a police lineup is more subtle and more, you know, one off than those cases are. But yeah, if you say, you know, if you if you hint at something that was a feature of that person when it maybe wasn't, people will tend to incorporate details into their memories. Mm -hmm. Memory memory works a lot more like, I, I like to think of memory as like an improvisational jazz performance, right? Where you might repeat some themes from one retelling to the next, um, but the details might not be exactly the same. But if you ask people what they remember, they remember the themes. And then the details could come from any one of those recall episodes and they might change over time, right? So you might be stuck more with your most recent performance, not the first, first one. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to think of memory though as playing back perfectly like a CD recording of a concert. Right? And that's just not how memory tends to work. Some things yeah. we do recall with detail. We don't, we don't forget everything. We don't change everything, but determining which things people are gonna remember and which ones they aren't isn't trivial. Right. I want to ask you something else that just uh, crossed my mind. And I thought about this before as well, because I work in the, you know, I do, I'm doing 3D work and all this stuff. Right. And so people often will show, uh, for example, like an animated, uh, you know, recreations or reconstructions. Mm -hmm. But then even more recently, thinking about the recent technology, like virtual reality right. and things like that. Is there a danger where, for example, you could put like a virtual reality or show somebody an animation and say, yeah, this is what happened. And all of a sudden they're like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's very much a concern, right? Mm. That, um, you know, and I'm sure that's an issue that you've had to think about a lot, which is that, you know, when people witness event, um, if, if you can get a really precise visualization of that event, it's going to be hard to separate that precise interpretation of what happened, which is based on assumptions, um, from what they actually remembered. So yeah, absolutely, that you, you could conflate those two. Um, we've played around a little, a little bit with this kind of in an informal way with a really 
kind of simple study. We had an augmented reality sort of study where you were asked to kind of identify and recognize some shapes, right? Um, sometimes the shapes were actually physically present, sometimes they weren't. And we were interested in, would people remember the one that they'd virtually manipulated at, differently from the ones that they, and you know, people conflate the two. Mm -hmm. um, if you saw yourself virtually playing with an object, you might remember having actually played with the object. Right? And right. it's really hard to separate those two because our memory doesn't really keep the source that that distinct, right? We, we know we've experienced this, but when did we experience the exact detail in which the car was rotated that way, right? Was it in the original event or was it in the simulation that showed it drifting, right? Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, and there was another uh, there was another aspect in the in the book that you mentioned where um, I, I'm trying to remember the names, but it was like two close friends, and it had to do with the Patrick Stewart incident. So, <laughs> yeah. and I thought that was pretty yeah. interesting, where you know yeah. uh, people are recounting a story and they connect with it really well, but then over time yeah. they they say that it happened to them, but it wasn't yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, you incorporate it, right? I and mean, we've all had this happen, right? And that you you, you tell a joke back to somebody who told it to you in the first place, right? Because you forgot the source of yeah. where you got the joke. And, or you you kind of tell a story of some event over and over and over again, and eventually you kind of start to think it happened to you. So yeah, this was a, a good friend of ours who was telling the story about having uh, run into Patrick Stewart at Legal Seafood, a restaurant, popular Boston restaurant, mm -hmm. um, and that he had ordered a baked Alaska or something like this. And you know, our friend who was telling telling this back to um, Chris Chabri, my co-author, was telling, you know, it was his friend, our friend was telling the story back to Chris as if it had happened to him, but it had actually happened to Chris. Um, and the person who was telling us the story is a false memory researcher that he had actually done a lot of research on memory distortion. <laughs> so it made it even better. But yeah, it's, it's really easy to have that happen. And yeah. that's how you can end up with, you know, two people who remember a childhood event each happening to them when the, you thought it happened to the other person. It's it's very easy to have those sorts of memory distortions, especially when they're not you know consequential now. Right. There was a I, I didn't mention it, but I, I will mm -hmm. anyway. But it, it was in your book. You also mentioned about the the fence, the yeah. book fence, and you talk about this particular case. Yeah. And I probably should have yeah. should have talked about it up front. But what can you tell us about the, the this particular case and how it really sure. uh, aligns with your work? Yeah, so this was a famous case out of out of Boston, um, and Dick Lair is an investigative journalist who wrote a series of articles for the Boston Globe about it, and then later did a lot more research and wrote into this nonfiction book about this case and its aftermath and the consequences of it. Um, this was a case in which uh, there was a police call that there had been a shooting and um, a police officer had been shot. That turns out probably not to have been the case, but uh, the call led to a high-speed police chase in Boston at night, about, I think it was early morning hours on a Sunday. Um, the chase led to a cul-de-sac um, with surrounded by a fence, and suspects got out of their car, and uh, one of them scaled over the fence, scaled the fence. The first officer on the scene was an undercover narcotics officer named Michael Cox. Um, he was in an unmarked car and was not wearing a uniform. Um, he tried to scale the fence after the suspect, um, kind of tried to grab for him, didn't quite get him, fell back to the ground, starts scaling the fence again, and another group of cops who arrived on the scene after him saw him scaling the fence, pulled him down, and beat the crap out of him mm. because they thought he was the suspect, which, of course, doesn't justify beating the crap out of him anyway. Right. But it was a, a group of, of officers beating another officer. Um, so while that's happening, a number of other cars arrive on the scene, and one of them um, has, uh, is driven by Kenny Connolly, um, another Boston police officer, who sees the suspect scale the fence, um, sprints after him, scales the fence, chases him down a mile later, and brings him back to be arrested. But the fact that he saw the person scaling the fence means that he was looking right where that beating was taking place. Right. So he was looking right at that scene at that moment and ran right past it. And he claimed throughout that he never saw the beating. Right? He just claimed not to see it. Right? And um, this, uh, this was something that prosecutors didn't believe. Right? Uh, Dick Lair didn't believe, um, investigative journalists. Uh, they all thought that his testimony was covering for the other cops, that it was a you know, blue wall of silence, that mm -hmm. people weren't going to rat out other cops who were responsible for this beating, even though they had beaten up another cop, right? 
Um, the, the three people who, can, who beat Michael Cox were never criminally charged. Um, I think they lost a civil suit at some point. Uh, I don't remember the details of that, but Connolly was charged with perjury and obstruction of justice for claiming to have run right past the scene of it and not being willing to testify about it. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting about that is as the only one charged, um, his testimony is what put him at the scene of the crime, right? At the scene of the beating, his own testimony put him there. He said, yeah, I think I would have seen that. Right? And um, jurors interviewed about the case said, well, you know, my uncle is a cop and they're trained to notice everything. Right. So, you know, the intuition is, of course, he would have seen this. He must have seen this. So he must be lying. Right? And that's the standard sort of analysis you get whenever there might be a memory failure mm -hmm. that or a perception failure in this case that, well, they must have seen it. They must have remembered it. They must be lying. Right. It's the standard conclusion that people will come to when it's quite possible he just literally ran right past it and didn't see it because he was so intently focused on chasing down this guy, scaling the fence. Right. Um, yeah. So it's Dick Lehrer eventually sort of changed his mind uh, on this after having written many articles about um, how Conley was protecting other officers or likely was, or what the connections were between him and the officers who were involved in the beating. Um, so, you know, did they know each other? How well did they know each other? Those sorts of investigative questions. Um, later kind of came to the view that no, he probably didn't see it. Right? right. It might well have been a case of inattentional blindness. Now, we never know, right, in any individual case, whether somebody's lying or whether they just are telling the truth and they never saw yeah. it. That's the hard part. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So tell me, what is next for you? What kind of, I mean, you've done a ton of research in this area. You're doing all mm -hmm. kinds of cool stuff. So are, what kind of things are you, what can you talk about that you, you know, are planning to do in the future? Um, I mean, one of the things that we do now a lot in my lab is um, a lot of the research we do doesn't have the sort of kind of humorous value of, a, of putting a person in a gorilla suit in a video, right? That, that's, you know, that's a demo and it, you know, it, it really conveys the idea well um, and in a real sort of practical sort of way. Um, but it's not the best way to systematically study how this works, right? What we're likely to notice and what we're not. Um, what makes us likely to notice something, what doesn't. So a lot of what we do over the last decade has been focusing on that question. What are the aspects of focusing attention that cause us to miss things? What sorts of things do we miss depending on how we're focusing attention? And to do that, we use much more boring displays, kind of computer controlled displays, but mm -hmm. they allow us to sort of systematically vary how similar, how similar the things that you're paying attention to are to the things you're trying to ignore, to the things that are unexpected. Right. So that's one angle. Um, another we're trying to look at and have been doing for many years is looking at individual differences in whether or not there are people who notice things versus don't. And for some contexts, right, if you if you ask people to deliberately try to detect changes, for example, people vary in how good they are at that. It doesn't seem to be the case that if something unexpected happens, that there's anything we can do to predict who's going to notice and who isn't. We really don't find many systematic individual differences. We don't find groups of noticers and groups of missers. Um, and it's not clear why. It could just be that whether or not you notice at any moment is just like a flip of the coin. Right. Um, but people are convinced that there must be differences between people who notice and people who don't, right? because it's that same intuition. Like I, I get emails maybe once every couple of weeks from somebody who says, well, I showed the videos, you know, I noticed it and I showed it to my son and he noticed it, but my wife and my daughter, they didn't notice it. So are there sex differences? I'm like, no. There don't seem to be. Yeah, um, you just you had a chance of that happening, and it did. And we get the same email with the opposite pattern. Um, so I'm interested in trying to study whether there are such differences, and if so, are they useful to predict? Because if they are, it'd be really good to know that, right? We'd want uh, we'd want those people who are good at inattentional blindness at, at mm -hmm. detecting the objects to be, you know, airport baggage scanners, for example. Yeah, for sure. But there don't seem to be that many systematic differences for the unexpected things. Um, it, so one interesting thing that you said there, and I noticed in some of the tests that you have run, um, mm -hmm. you, for example, sometimes you'll change color. Mm -hmm. And then what's interesting about the gorilla experiment is that there's something which is moving as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering in some cases, uh, like I can see that humans should be good, especially on the peripheral to see things that are moving. I've heard that before mm -hmm. that, you know, when things are moving at you, whatever, it's, it's sort of a safety mechanism. Mm -hmm. So that might be better. Where, where do you see people being the, like, do you see something that's like, people just don't notice this at all. Like the, 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 it's really a high percentage of people miss it. I mean, you, you can create things that are very hard to notice, especially if they're similar to what it, 
to the things that you're trying to ignore, right? So if you make it blend into the stuff that's being ignored, yeah, people miss it all the time. If it's yeah. more similar to the thing you're paying attention to, you tend to notice it more. So in, the, in that gorilla video, right, if we have people pay attention to the players wearing black, they're much more likely to notice the person in the gorilla suit than the, when they're paying attention to the players wearing white because it's more similar to the, what they're focusing on and less similar to the things they're deliberately trying to block, right? And so th that's one of the key elements, that the more similar you make it to the things you're ignoring, the more likely you are to miss it. Um, right, right. So if, if, if you're going to have it blend in, that's a good way to do it. Um, yeah, for sure. But uh, I'm not convinced that even moving things consistently grab attention. Right? This has been a debate. Most of the research on what captures attention, what grabs you, um, uses really simplistic displays without any motion in them with kind of letters flashed on a computer screen for a short amount of time. It's not representative of what we encounter in the world. It's not the person jumping out from behind a tree and yelling boo sort of attention capture. Right, right. Um, but if you think about the world, if you just walk around, there's tons of moving stuff all the time. Trees blowing in the wind, cars driving by. Mm -hmm. And if you're not trying to cross the street, noticing those cars, I don't know that you'd notice if a clown car went by. Right, right, right. If you're not paying attention to the trees, you might not notice a gorilla you know, at the base of one of them, right? Because you're not looking over there. So we filter out a lot of motion as well. So I'm not convinced that things that are moving automatically grab us either. Yeah, that's a good point. So last thing. Um, so I'm reading the book and as I'm going through, I'm like, okay, I'm not good at that. Let me go next bit. <laughs> I'm not good at that. Okay. I'm no good here. So, yeah. but at the end of the book, you try to end off on a positive note. So that's good. But um, I think there's a lot of positive here, right? That oh, there we're is, there really is. good yeah. at the things we need to be good at. Like we're right. really good at focusing attention mm -hmm. and not getting distracted. And even, even people who have attention problems are good at that relative to the idea that we take in everything. We don't want to take in everything. We want to be able to exclude irrelevant stuff because most of the stuff we're excluding doesn't matter to us. Right, and it's right. relatively rare that there's a person walking through the scene in a gorilla suit, right? right. It, it's most of the time we see what we want, what we need to see. So really these are byproducts of, of limitations um, of our minds. And the big danger is that we don't realize we have them, right? Yeah. Not, not that we have them. Yeah, and I, th well, I think, you know, the takeaway for me was just be aware of the limitations. Yeah. And I think that that's something that, you know, I don't think has really been communicated uh, for things like trials and things like that. You know, with the, whatever the person says, it's taken at, you know, face value. And we don't often question, you know, it, you know, maybe they really didn't, you know, they're not seeing things the same way, or we can understand why there may be, you know, five different people and five mm -hmm. different, you know, uh, yeah. testimonies as to what happened. So yeah. um, I think just realizing the the uh, limitations and the confidence, you know, not being mm -hmm. as confident in your thing that that those yeah. to me seems like strong messages. Yeah. And there's more there's more awareness of that in the courts than there used to be. Right. It, it used to be that you trust the witnesses without any question. And um, the idea that people might have seen things differently. Yeah, that that'll happen and that they'll remember things differently. If people converge on what they remembered independently, that's really good, right? That's yeah. going to be more likely to be reliable. Um, circumstantial evidence is often more compelling than witness testimony, depending on how the witness testimony was gathered. Right. Um, yeah. It can be more convincing. So, yeah. Let me, uh, if I can, I'm, I'm going to put up uh, just, this is, uh, well, you're you're on LinkedIn, right? If anyone wanted to get a hold I'm of you. I'm or... not on LinkedIn. but oh, you're I'm, not? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, at you know at prof simons um p-r-o-f-s-i-m-o-n-s -S. okay um you're not hard to find yeah <laughs> so yeah. i can Search tell you that you'll, you'll find uh, it someplace. yeah you're all over youtube and everything yeah. else and uh it comes up here from the uh university of illinois so that this will come up here mm -hmm. so if you ever want to get a hold of uh, daniel he's here Simons.com uh, actually is uh the best place to go to get all of those things just is that your personal mind. website that's my personal website yep oh, just dansimons.com okay you'll, you'll find me there Awesome. Dan, hey, listen, thanks so much. Um, do me a favor, hang back here. I'm just going to yep. make some closing comments and I'll come back and I'll chat with you. But great information, great research, um, extremely important, I think, in the area, especially where, where we work. So, hey, look, I really appreciate you, uh, yep. your, your input here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Take care. Bye. Yep, you too. All right, folks. So that does it for uh, this particular one. Really interesting information there. Um, you know, something that I don't think that people really consider as much as they should in, you know, a forensic contest uh, or context at trials and things like that.
So just to close, uh, don't forget a couple of things uh, on the training side. If you're interested in the Cloud Compare course, then uh, just head over to ai2-3d.com. You can sign up for that. And the other one that is coming up in January of uh, January 17th to 20th, 2022, that's the Forensic Photography Symposium. Just head over to the website, hit on the FPS menu item, and then you will be able to see it from there. Thank you very much, everybody. That does it for this one. Uh, we are planning to be back next week. And so hopefully we'll see you there. I wish you all a great day. Thank you to all the people who have been coming from South America and, and Middle East and everywhere else. So uh, all the best to you and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.